When we were studying coat color, we saw how Mendel's law of segregation and law of independent assortment can help us predict how chromosomes segregate into gametes. By applying Mendel's laws to our studies of coat color and ear size, we determined that a parent heterozygous at two loci can produce four different gametes. However, these results are puzzling, right? I mean, for starters, the cross produced four different phenotypes. The first time we did these sort of studies with coat color, we only got two. Well, remember that a Punnett square made it a lot easier to keep track of genotypic and phenotypic possibilities. So let's see if it can help us here. All right, so why don't you pause the video and get a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil, and we can try to do this together. Okay, so let's make sure that we use the same abbreviations for all of the alleles that we're going to be talking about. So let's have big B represent the brown coat, little b will represent the white coat, and for the ears, let's have big E represent small ears, and little e represent big ears. Okay? So we know we have parents that are heterozygous at two different genes that can produce four different gametes. So to start off, let's write those gametes down. Now let's write the mother's gametes up here, and we can have big B, big E, big B, little e, big E, little b, and little b, little e. All right, and the father is heterozygous at the same genes, so let's write those same gametes down for the father as well. Now we need to draw our Punnett square box, so let's do that. And now let's draw in the boxes to represent all of the different progeny. All right, so we have 16 different boxes here in our Punnett square, meaning that there are 16 different genotypes that this cross can produce. So let's just go through and figure out what those genotypes are. If you recall from our monohybrid cross, that's pretty simple. All we did was we took the letters that appear above the square and the letters that appear to the left of the square and write them down in the square. And we'll do that for all of these different boxes. So the first one here is going to be big B, big B, big E, big E. Right, and the next one here is going to be big B, big B, big E, little e. Okay, so now that we have all our genotypes written out, we can begin to assess what kind of data to expect from a cross like this. Now, this is sort of confusing, right? This is just a bunch of letters. What we really want to know is what kind of phenotypic output these genotypes are going to produce. So all we have to do is go through and figure out what phenotype each of these genotypes is going to produce. Now Big B, Big B, for instance, is going to produce a brown coat. Big E, Big E is going to produce little ears. So let's go through all 16 boxes here and figure out what phenotype we'd expect to see for each of these hamsters. Don't forget to keep in mind, though, that we established that the big B allele is dominant over the little b allele and that the big E allele is dominant over the little e allele. So notice that the Punnett square allows us to predict that we will see four different phenotypes. We're going to get brown hamsters with little ears, brown hamsters with big ears, white hamsters with little ears, and white hamsters with big ears. The Punnett square also allows us to predict the ratio at which these different phenotypes will occur. Out of 16 different squares here, I have one square that will produce white hamsters with large ears. There are three squares here that predict white hamsters with little ears. There are also three squares that predict brown hamsters with big ears. And that leaves nine squares that predict brown hamsters with little ears. To summarize, our Punnett square predicts a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio among the four different phenotypes. This is indicative of a dihybrid cross. A dihybrid cross is simply a cross between two individuals heterozygous at two different genes. By applying Mendel's law of inheritance, we've been able to help Adrian explain the unusual 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio of phenotypes he observed in his experiment. This means that 
the conclusions that we drew from our first experiment that a monohybrid cross produces a 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio is still correct. Furthermore, our second flying hamster experiment helped us understand chromosome segregation even better. As a side note, notice that producing data which does not fit with your current hypothesis is not necessarily bad. In fact, it could be the basis for the next big scientific discovery. So in summary, a dihybrid cross is a cross between individuals that are heterozygous at two different loci. A dihybrid cross produces a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio between the four different phenotypes.